Coming up on DTNS, Amazon brings its cashierless tech to Whole Foods. Twitter adds a new way to remove followers called Remove Follower. And is long distance wireless charging about to have its moments? DTNS, start. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, September 8th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And, I, and I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Are, are you sure? <laughs> Hesitated. Okay. Just double checking. We uh, just had a long and disturbing conversation about tarantulas. Uh, if you'd like to hear it, get Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. That is where you can join our top patrons, such as Dr. X17, Dustin Campbell, and Tim Deputy. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google announced updates to its workspace productivity suite. The company launched its previously announced dashboards for real-time project collaboration called Spaces. That now includes a unified dashboard with access to inboxes, chats, and meetings, able to reply to all spaces from a single location. Google Meet uh, is now calling, it's now available for one-to-one -one chats in Gmail across mobile and desktop. Google also announced new Meet hardware with a 27-inch all-in-one and a 65-inch 4K display made in partnership with Avacore. Both come with Google's Jamboard app and can be used as an external display. Great, a new place to get Google Meet calls. Uh, variety sources say that HBO Max is expanding into Europe starting October 26th. It's going to come to Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, Spain, and Andorra. 14 more European countries will get the service later in 2022. Although sources say there are no plans at the moment to launch in Germany or the UK. DJI announced the OM5, the latest in its smartphone gimbal line, previously branded as Osmo. The OM5 is a third smaller than its predecessor. It includes a built-in selfie stick extension rod with a new clamp designed to fit over a phone case. On the software side, it includes Active Track 4.0 for better subject tracking, able to track at up to 3x zoom at 5 milliseconds. The OM5 is available today for $159. Facebook and Ray-Ban teased a September 9th announcement. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg previously said in July that smart glasses with Ray-Ban's iconic form factor would be the next uh, hardware release from the company, but that it would be a stepping stone to someday getting full augmented reality glasses. Lenovo announced the Chromebook Duet 5, a follow-up to the original detachable Duet tablet, featuring a 13.3-inch OLED screen and powered by Qualcomm's Snapdragon 7C Gen 2 compute platform. Despite the higher-end screen, the tablet starts at $429.99, expected to ship in October. All right, Scott, let's talk about this Whole Foods thing. All right, here's the deal. You want to get some food? I got an idea for you. Amazon plans to bring its Just Walk Out cashierless technology to two Whole Food stores in Glover Park neighborhood in Washington, D.C., and the other in Sherman Oaks, an area of Los Angeles uh, in California, obviously set up to open in 2022. Uh, customers don't have to use it, though. So if you still like the old-fashioned way of doing things, self-checkout lanes and customer service booths will still be available to you. Uh, you need those if you want to pay cash, EBT, EWIC, or gift cards, that sort of stuff. But if you want to just use, uh, don't want to use any of those options, uh, and you'd rather do it yourself, you can scan a QR code from the Whole Foods or Amazon app, insert a credit or debit card that is already linked to your Amazon account, or scan your palm with Amazon One, which is also linked to your Amazon account. Uh, when you leave, you scan or insert the card again. Uh, and it will work with self-aware items like uh, self fresh squeeze. Not self-aware. Oh, what I sell? So self-aware. Yeah. <laughs> hey, look, self-aware orange juice, everybody. That's the that's the buried headline here. Uh, fresh squeezed orange juice, as an example, mochi ice cream, if you will. Uh, they did uh, not use bulk nuts as an example, uh, and those are very popular at Whole Foods stores. I can confirm that. Anyway, Amazon says the stores will employ a comparable number of people at existing uh, Whole Foods market stores, so they're not going to. Uh, you're not going to see a big drop in how many people work at these stores. You're still going to see kind of, you know, what we used to have. The robots aren't taking over just yet. So uh, it's happening. Walk out with whatever you want, and it knows you took it, and you pay for it, and you're done. At Whole Foods. They, 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 this is a, a, a reaction to this story that I've encountered multiple times today. This isn't new. This isn't the debut of the technology. This is technology that Amazon's been uh, operating at a few hundred locations around the world, in the UK and the US particularly, at smaller stores like Amazon Go, but also big grocery stores like Amazon Fresh. And 
it's now bringing it to Whole Foods. So this is the mass adoption of it. They have a lot more Whole Foods stores than they have Amazon Go and Amazon Fresh. Uh, but this isn't trying it out. This isn't the beta test run. This is, we think this is good enough to just put in all of the regular stores. Now, granted, they're starting with two, so they're obviously not so confident they're going to roll it out everywhere at once. But I think that's to see how the Whole Foods market people respond to it and work out some of those kinks before they go and spend the money to install all the sensors and everything that they have to do to have this working everywhere. But this, this is true cashierless technology, and it's fairly proven by this point. What I found interesting, and obviously Amazon's going to say this, is don't worry, we're not going to fire all of our cashiers. They will just be better served to you, our valued customer. And, you know, that's lip service to some extent. You know, any company is going to say that so that you don't have much people freaking out. But I do wonder, okay, let's let's just take that at face value. What would those employees be able to help me with that are still in the store and working all day and 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 doing their thing and and getting paid for it? I would kind of love the idea of I don't know, a pasta expert, you know, who's who's sort of in a certain area of the store and as I'm going through maybe can give me a little bit more information about recipes or some tips and tricks. That I, I mean, might sound a little bit pipe dreamish, but I can see where this would come in handy where it's like, you know what you want. You come in, you don't have to, you know, do all the waiting in line to to get your groceries out the door. Of course, they're still they're still gonna offer those options for folks who don't want to do the just walk out cashierless option, at least at first, right? There's definitely gonna be a, a period where people are doing all sorts of things and you can't just get any anything that you want in the store this way. But I like the idea of of having folks working in grocery stores who want to work there who might have some expertise and can I, help me out. I mean, I just want to add anecdotally, my local supermarket, when they don't have the people at the registers, they are doing the carts where people do the online orders and they pick it up at the front. And so there's at least three or four of them. And so they have the full staff that I see every day working, but they're not always at the register. So yeah. I could conceivably offset them to a different job. Ca mm -hmm. Cashier is not the only job of the cashier. When the cashier is not at the cashier, they're doing other things. Uh, I, I've said multiple times before that I don't think smart businesses cash in on the savings of automation by getting rid of employees. Smart businesses, and we've seen this in history, when you bring in a computer to do the work of humans that were once called computers, you don't just cut down on the staff. You find things that you couldn't do before that those humans can do. And in Whole Foods' case, I'm guessing that's better service, like Sarah is talking about. Uh, being able to help you with your self-checkout, or if you're you know, like new to the palm scanning, they're gonna have somebody greeting you at the door that's like, hey, let me help you figure this out and point you in the right direction. And that's smarter. Use those humans to do things that humans are particularly good at and that make an, the experience of shopping there better so that people are like, yeah, I really love going to that cashierless store because they've got all these helpful people. I don't have to run somebody down and they look kind of annoyed because they're busy doing something else when I ask them a question. And this is a really little thing, but you know, I'm a person who I don't go to the grocery store every day. I go maybe once every couple of weeks and I'm stocking up. I, you know, I'm meal planning for myself for a while. So I got lots of bags and I got lots of stuff. And some of that is frozen items, say. And man, if I don't choose the you know, right day and time, I'm waiting in line for a while and stuff starts to melt. Uh, you know, or you start to feel like mm, not so fresh. I really got to get home, get the stuff in the fridge. This this does take out a layer of complexity big time for me. Twitter launched a few feature tests. Uh, we got to talk about a couple of them here. One changes the way photos are displayed on mobile, taking up the whole width of a phone screen. That's currently in testing on iOS apps. The second lets users remove followers without blocking them. Uh, this is getting a lot of attention. It's in testing on the web and would cause your content to disappear from the removed followers' feeds, but without notifying them. So it's a little different than a block, because if they go to your Twitter profile, if they're blocked, they won't see your Twitter feed at all. If you've removed them as a follower, they'll still see your Twitter feed if they navigate to it, but they won't get it in their timeline. Many users are pointing out, you can already kind of do this by blocking a user and then unblocking them right away, which forces them to unfollow you, but doesn't keep them blocked. Although they could still refollow you if that happened uh, and they noticed. 
But Twitter does have a habit of making features official that started as workarounds, so this isn't too surprising. Right now, to remove a follower, you have to go to your profile, if you have the feature, not everybody has it, but if you have it, go to your profile, view your list of followers, then you find the one you want to remove, click on a three-dot icon next to the follow button for that follower, and select remove this follower from the drop-down menu. Uh, Twitter might add this feature to the follower's profile icon to make it easier to access in the future. Pretty interesting uh, move, um, and you're right. It feels like a workaround that people, they probably saw this happen enough. They're like, we got to just, you know, we got to just make this real or, you know, make it part of the thing. But because there's there's a little a little bit of uh, detail missing on whether or not those people can immediately follow you again if they've noticed that you've done this, um, I have real questions about whether this is any better than a block. A block at least is final and you're sort of done and we're out of there. Um, so, so I'm not, I'm kind of on the fence on whether this is a thing I'm going to, actually use as somebody who's had to block a lot lately so uh yeah uh, the jury's out for me i don't know i don't know how i'm going to use this thing but um i guess i like that they're adding features there's probably a lot of people like me who use tweetbot and other third-party apps that are probably going great is this another thing we're not going to get with the api to these third parties or are, are we going to get it that is a concern to me if it's something they want me to use like let me use it on whatever app i'm using but outside of that concern um yeah, I just I need to know what the 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 exact situation might be where I would need to do this versus a block, and I I can't think. This feels like, it's like mute and then another step. Is well, what yeah, okay. Feels like. So mm -hmm. when when yeah. this when I heard about this feature, I actually by accident learned about the block unblock feature because I blocked somebody by accident years ago, and then I unblocked them, and then I was like, oh, now they're not following me. Well, now it's like awkward because now I have to be like, hey, sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry that I did that to you, but. If you actually wanted someone to unfollow you and, you know, what's sort of known as the soft block feature where you're, you're kind of kicking them out of chat, but they can come back if they so desire. You're not really blocking them. You're, you're Because a block goes both ways. You don't see them, they don't see you. But if you're talking about, I don't know, an issue of harassment, you know, sometimes a block can feel very dramatic. And so I know what Twitter's doing here by saying, maybe this is like a little bit of a softer way to just nudge somebody you know, kind of out of your life. What I think Twitter should have done, and I don't know how possible this is, uh, is something that is like a self mute. So let's say, let's say Scott is like, you know, I don't really want Sarah to follow me anymore, uh, but I don't want to block her because maybe that will, you know, you know, incite some other issue. You know, maybe Sarah will b bother me on another platform or like email me or it'd get weird. And if I just kick her off, then she can follow me again. What if I were able to mute myself towards a select person so that if I went to your profile, profile still exists, it just doesn't seem like you're tweeting because mm. I don't see the tweets anymore from that point forward. Now, yeah. again, that's not what this is. That's what I think is the better feature mm. that Twitter should that's offer. That's interesting, yeah. Mute yeah. two. Yeah, yeah. mute, mute 2.0. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, we've moved moved on to the the, the true destination of mute. Uh, we'll see. But they also launched a test of its own version of groups. Now, this has me kind of excited in a weird way. Uh, they're calling these communities, which it says is uh, basically this. And this is a quote, a more intimate space for conversations, unquote, mm. uh, on their platform. It's part subreddit, maybe part Facebook group, if you want to think of it that way. A community is dedicated to a topic and members can post tweets to a dedicated group timeline. All communities are public and viewable by anyone. So no private groups like in Facebook's case. Uh, moderators set rules for the community and members who can post must be invited by a moderator or existing member. And Twitter's launching this with just a few communities it'll open up to for more of these users and uh, more communities to be created in the future, uh, pretty much the coming months. You can find communities in the tab in the center of the Twitter app, assuming you're seeing the rollout. I haven't, it's not showing up on mine yet, but uh, I don't know what that means. It might mean my app's out of date, but anyway, fa uh, I like this a lot. And I also like that it's public. This isn't just another place for people to crawl into their weird hole and say stuff maybe they shouldn't be or plan weird things that maybe are illegal or whatever. Uh, this is more like Reddit where uh, it's like, hey, here's a group and we're all part of it. If you want to be a part of it, you got to be approved. But now that you're in here, you can talk too. And I don't know, I feel like maybe Twitter could use this. I know I can. Me too. My gut reaction was this is Reddit. Why like so it's gonna fail because we already have Reddit. Why would people use this? But Twitter is such a place for this kind of thing that I feel like maybe it will catch on. Maybe Twitter users will make it their own and find a different 
slant to it than than there is on subreddit. Uh, so so I'm giving it a, a chance more than like moments and some of the other things they've they've tried. Yeah, I uh, when Twitter is my go to place for if there's some I don't know there's some you know news event or so, something happens with a celebrity or you know there's a you know sports game or a show that I like you know I always do a Twitter search just be like let's just let's just see what people are talking about around the world. Um, and I use Tweetbot, so my 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 Twitter experience is a little bit different than anybody who's using official Twitter apps. But uh, and I find a lot of information all the time. I can I can often get a temperature of like, okay, this is what everybody else thinks. Do I follow all those people at this point? Well, no, we might not have a lot of other things in common, and that would kind of muck up you know all of my followers because I try to curate it at least to some extent. But to have a community where it's like, okay, we want to talk about the Golden State Warriors. That's my community on Twitter. I can do that other places, but I hang out on Twitter enough that I think this is a great feature. During the game, right? During the big playoff game, you're going to want to be with other Warriors fans on Twitter. You're not going to want to be with the Rockets fans or the Cavs or whoever they're playing, right? So you go to the Golden State Warriors community and you all chat about the game there. That's that's fun. I I like that. Hey, folks, what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? Well, We don't have a Twitter community yet because they haven't rolled it out to us, but we do have a subreddit. Go submit your stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Wireless charging right now is limited to very short range. Everybody wants it, but it is limited. You basically have to sit the device on the charger. The only thing that really makes it wireless is that you don't have to plug the charger into the device. So-called long-range charging has been around for a while with Motorola able to charge a device up to a meter away. It's three feet, but that's not very far away. Three feet. You know, you still got to be pretty close, but that distance is getting a little farther. Motorola, which works with the company Guru on its space charging, wireless charging, just announced a new version of its five watt system that can charge four devices at once up to three meters away with a 100 degree area of coverage. It's a big flat square. It stands on its end. We don't have a release date for this, but that's promising. And Motorola is not the only company doing this. Ossia, which has U.S. approval for one meter charging, just got regulatory approval in the U.K. for unlimited range. But don't get too excited Mm because Ossia's tech only works up to about 10 meters. Still, we're getting farther. Ossia stations are a flat square, about a foot on each side. Energis is another company that's been offering a developer kit for charging smart home devices with radio waves. Powercast also uses radio waves and markets its tech for hand sanitizer stations, sells a $150 adapter for charging Nintendo Switch Joy-Con controllers from six inches away. Y-Charge uses infrared and markets itself toward smart devices like automatic faucets, door locks, electric toothbrushes. Xiaomi showed off Mi Air Charge in January, and Oppo demonstrated wireless air charging in February. This is being worked on by many. So short term, the device makers and the wireless charging tech developers need to work together to create an ecosystem of some kind for consumers before this can really take off. Everybody can't just have their own technology that doesn't play with other uh, devices well. Usually, that means coalescing around a standard, and every developer wants to be the developer of that standard, so this might take a couple years to settle on, as we have seen in the past. The long-term hope is that all of these companies, from all of these companies, is that once wireless charging becomes viable, multiple devices can have smaller batteries, or maybe not even have batteries at all, as they're constantly being charged. Yeah, so it's, we're in the chicken and egg stage. Uh, this this tech works. It's not super long range yet, but it works. But we need we don't we need the devices before uh, a platform can take off. But you need a platform to be established before people will put it in their devices. Uh, and you know that's where we were with Bluetooth for a while. It's where we were with USB. It's where we were with short range wireless charging until I Apple put the cheese standard in and everybody kind of coalesced around that. So yeah, it's going to take a few years for that part of this to be worked out. And obviously we'd like that long range that you were talking about to have that ideal future where you just have your house filled with the kind of radio waves like you have right now, your house is filled with radio waves right now. If you, especially if you got Wi-Fi, you're broadcasting them. Uh, and, and you would just, uh, be able to power devices with that and they'd be constantly charged. Uh, but 
you know, we, we've basically got the technology almost there. Now we're moving into the hard part of working out the business models. Yeah, I'm going to uh, let me talk to the gamers in the crowd real quick. Just imagine, if you will, a console manufacturer, Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, somebody in the future, they make a console and that console includes wireless charging technology, which means your controllers are batteryless. You never charge them ever. They're just always uh, being charged. They're basically plugged in through the air and you never have to worry about batteries again. Batteries either going bad or having to replace them or any of that stuff or running out of juice when you are when you least need it in the middle of your first person shooter or whatever. I'm telling you, gaming is where this is going to happen. It'll push the whole thing forward. As usual, it'll be like the impetus for change. So looking forward to it. All right, real quickly, Australia's high court ruled five to two that Australians may be held responsible for the defamatory comments left on their social media pages if they control them. Not the social media company, not just the person who commented, but you, if you haven't done anything about them. It's a case involving Dylan Voller, who's suing multiple news outlets, including the Australian and Sky News, over photos of Voller being restrained at a youth detention center. The news companies posted these stories on their Facebook pages. And Voller sued not over posting the photos, that was news, but over defamatory comments left by users in reactions to the news stories that were posted on Facebook. The court ruled in Voller's favor, saying that the companies could be considered publishers of the comments left on the pages they controlled and therefore held legally responsible. Voller still has to go and prove that the comments were defamatory, so he hasn't won his case, but it gives him the standing to sue the news agencies. The news agencies were saying, hey, we didn't leave these comments, users did, not our problem. Court said, yeah, but you encouraged them. In fact, the court ruled that the media companies showed, quote, intentional participation in the process of sharing third-party comments and therefore were responsible for them, even if they did not post them or claimed they were unaware of them. The court wrote, Having taken action to secure the commercial benefit of the Facebook functionality, the appellants bear the legal consequences. I think that's interesting because it's not saying Facebook is responsible. We have in the United States Section 230, the court's saying, sure, Facebook isn't responsible. It's just a platform. But if you use Facebook and invite people to comment, well, then you have a responsibility to police those comments. The decision might deter companies and individuals from allowing comments on their pages, might set a precedent for rulings and laws elsewhere. Uh, but for now, it's it's uh, something that Australian news companies are going to have to deal with. Yeah, it's fascinating uh, to, to see this happen because, like you said, it's not necessarily a precedent in the legal sense, not yet. Well, it is but, in uh, Australia, but it's it not is a in Australia, outside exactly. of Australia. You're right. but, it, but outside of Australia, we're just sort of like, well... Is this the kind of thing we'll we'll start doing? And part of it makes sense to me. If I go to Facebook and I start a group uh, or even just a conversation and I'm in charge and I'm the one that kicked it off, I'm now kind of the one that maybe should be paying attention to it and moderating it. Um, when I think about it now, if I leave a uh, uh, put something on Facebook and I get horrible comments in there that are maybe, uh, I don't know, defamatory or something else, I just kind of ignore it and go, well, that's someone else talking. But... I don't know, if you get more mindful about the kind of stuff that's coming out of your conversations that you started and that you're continuing to add to, I think it's okay to take a little responsibility there. I'm not advocating for any laws or but any of that. But then why not make Facebook responsible for it? Well, and they should. I, like, that's, it feels weird that they're not. So you're against Section 230 then? No, I'm. <laughs> I, it's more nuanced than that. I can't make a black and white decision about this, unfortunately, because... Because you could make arguments in both directions that, that make it hard to make that choice. But I do like more personal responsibility on the Internet. And I don't know how to get there, but I like it. I, I think it also depends on, you know, where were the comments being made? Was it a news outlet where perhaps the news outlet just has to be a lot more careful about what kind, you know, if the comments are spir spi spiraling out of control on something that that news outlet originally published, and there are some, you know, questions about defamatory comments. And obviously, in Dylan Buller's case, you know, this is a very personal thing. Uh, that that is something to 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 question. I'm I I can think of one Facebook group I'm I'm a part of. It's the Supernatural VR community, uh, which is by and large a really great community on Facebook. It's one of the only Facebook groups that I'm actively participating in, or at least reading regularly. But it goes off the rails pretty often. 
you just you just conversations get weird and the moderators are constantly saying all right we're cu- we're shutting this down everybody be nice in the future no more comments um and i don't exactly know who the moderators of that group are but it but they're pretty on top of it and to say okay well if they weren't on top of it facebook needs to moderate this group that's impossible <laughs> it's impossible even if you say it will still should be facebook's uh, job at the end of the day because they built this platform it's their platform that's true but i i think that's a losing game as well well right and and it's never about facebook it's about the next facebook will the net will the competitor everybody wants a competitor of facebook if you make it so that the next platform is also responsible then they may never get out of the gate because it's too expensive to start a platform then uh, which is the argument for preserving section 230 but when you're talking about Supernatural, it sounds like they do a good job of moderation. Scott, if they weren't doing a good job of moderation and somebody said something nasty about Sarah on the Supernatural group and they weren't moderating, should Supernatural be held responsible? And could Sarah then sue Supernatural, not the person who made the comment? Well, I... Th- mm, no. Unless unless it goes up the chain where you can prove without a doubt that Supernatural contributed to the the bad well, that's part. The qu- that's the question. That's the question. And that's the question is that yeah. Voller isn't arguing that Sky News contributed to the defamatory comment. He's only arguing that these defamatory comments were made in response to this story and therefore the Sky News and the Australian are responsible for those comments. Right. Yeah, it's like I say, there's no simple there's no simple solution to this other than at least the one person who said the terrible stuff ought to be the most accountable. And then maybe we can talk about going from there, but you got to start there. Yeah. So if I said the mean thing to Sarah, I should be responsible. How about that? Self, let's put it on ourselves, people. Take responsibility. How how American of you. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. Just work it out. Just work it out. Yeah. Well, this is this is some good news uh, if you like uh, to be comfortable on your own vehicle. At the IAA Munich Auto Show, auto part supplier Continental is previewing its ambiance, that's ambiance with a three at the end, <laughs> concept car that heats more than just your seats or your armrests or your steering wheel in order to help control cabin temperature more effectively. Continental outfitted a classic VW microbus with fabrics with heating elements printed on the underside. So Continental's global director of design and marketing and digitization told CNET it heats 10 times faster than previous systems but it also uses less energy. Continental says automakers could install it in the ceiling, maybe the side panels for controlling temperature in zones or heating areas that are more specific, like behind the knees or the legs. It wouldn't replace traditional forced air heat, but it could let a car maker use a smaller system that also uses less power. Yeah, that's a big deal for EV, right? You you want to you want to save that that power. You, you don't want to you 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 don't want to drain even that second battery. Uh, so. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, I'm curious uh, who will pick it up. Obviously, this is a concept thing and an auto show. Uh, who knows if, if it'll ever even make it uh, into a car. But I, I love the idea of it, especially that ceiling thing, because a lot of times with forced air heat in cars, I've found you're really warm by the source. And if you're in the back seat, you're really cold. Like it's, it's not always great. I know there's other ways around it and there's some that have vents in the back and all that, but if you could just have it emanating from all around you, I, it seems like it would work a lot better and potentially save energy. I love that. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Jeremy wrote in about our conversation about the idea that you might be able to send a part of an encrypted chat to a moderator on WhatsApp. Jeremy says, Part of the story caught me as funny, but then not. The idea that people would be upset about moderators reading messages that were sent to them is ludicrous. That definitely seems like a duh moment. But what about the other parties in the conversations? Most states have laws about being recorded while having a conversation. This kind of seems like the same thing. Someone decides they don't like something that was said. They send it in with the other side having no idea that anything was being sent, let alone what was being sent. If they're expecting the conversation to be encrypted and only between them and the other party, this could be a rude awakening. Sure. Uh, so what's the alternative, Jeremy? No report button? No no way to ever report <laughs> abusive content? Like, maybe. Maybe that's what you're arguing. I'm not sure that it is, though. Uh, and it's not the same as as subverting encryption. 
expectation of privacy from the person you're communicating with is not the same as encryption. Encryption just says, until it gets to the person I intended it to get to, it's not readable by anybody else. Once that person has read it, Encryption doesn't have anything to say about what that person can do with the message, right? If I if I send you, and I, I sent this to Jeremy in an email, if I send you a note in a locked box that only you can unlock, once you've taken the message out of the locked box, if, I, if you pass it along to somebody else to read, that doesn't break the lock. The lock still worked. So it's a matter of trust between you and the person you're sending your message to at that point. Yeah, it's screen capping, all those, uh, copy and paste the text out if you want to. Like the your your friend isn't encryption. Your friend is trust, yeah. and that's it. It's the best as it gets. You can't encrypt people. No. Not yet, yet anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, ha if you have feedback like Jeremy, and thanks, Jeremy, by the way, for the email. Yeah, good uh, good uh, questions, comments, all that stuff that we talk about on this here show, do send it our way because it really helps us understand what, people care about. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We would also like to thank a few of our brand new bosses. They include Chris George, Eric, and Iggy Bud. All just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, George. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Iggy. Now, yesterday I noted we were one patron down over last month, uh, and we got three new bosses which you might think means we're up two, but we're not because we lost a couple more. So it took those three to, to bring us to break even. So very, very much appreciate Chris, George, and Eric, uh, I'm Chris, George, Eric, and Iggy uh, for, for jumping in. And uh, if you've been on the fence yourself, they can have back us, you know, we get some nice perks in there too. Go check them out. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Also big thanks to Scott Johnson for being with us today. Scott, how you been? Oh, you know, just great, Sarah. And uh, there's always something cool happening over at the Frog Pants Network. If you're looking for more game commentary, we now have three shows on the network that are all about gaming. Big issues on one, lots of console and PC stuff on another, and then indie coverage on a third. Wonder what those are all about? Want to subscribe to maybe one or two or all three of them? Check them out at frogpantsplays.com or frogpants.com will get you there as well. And if you're looking to uh, uh, poke me in public, find me on Twitter at twitter.com slash Scott Johnson. Just don't make him unfollow you, people. He's a good one. We're live on this show Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back doing it all tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. The Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>